I want to this this issue with Erica Gardner, first and foremost, and, and unfortunately there is an issue. Um, you would think that there would be an opportunity for us to simply mourn Erica, who passed away Saturday uh, after having suffering a um, asthma induced heart attack that uh, put her in a coma for a week. She had the heart attack on Christmas Eve and she passed away on this past Saturday. And as we mourned her, um, wow. As we mourned her, we were reminded by quite a few people that, uh, hello to everyone in the chat rooms. We were reminded by some people the different issues that Erica Gardner was not progressive or intersectional enough. Um, and before I get to that, I want to make sure that we remember her first and foremost as a human being. Um, as a mother, she recently gave birth uh, to her second child. She was only 27 years old. Uh, she was a daughter her father, her mother who's still living, um, and then her father, Eric Gardner, who was killed by uh, New York Police Department officer, Daniel Pantaleo, or Pantaleo, depending on who you speak to. Um, Eric Gardner, who was killed, his last words were, uh, I can't breathe, which galvanized an entire movement. People saw this video, a man who was uh, doing nothing wrong, placed in an illegal chokehold. Um, this catapulted Erica. She had the opportunity. Uh, I was listening to NPR this morning and um, she had the opportunity to deal with this in a way that most people do when tragedy strikes their family. They deal with it internally, personally and with their family. But Erica said, no, I'm going to use this to make an effect change. And she did that for three years. She fought in this movement, um, not only on behalf of her father, not only to help, uh, help the people help remember uh, her father's name, um, but also on behalf of other people. She got involved politically. Um, I'm telling you, she was fierce. Can I tell you the number one thing that I will always remember about uh, Erica is how fierce she, fearless she was. <laughs> absolutely, um, absolutely fearless. And people were, some people were terrified of her um, because she was an individual who had nothing to lose, right? She, she had nothing to lose and she, did, she had zero Fs to give. And, and that's, a, that's a beautiful thing, but it's also a terrifying thing when you're in this culture, particularly like me. Let's take me, for example. I, I generally try to be as fastidious with every word because I know how every word could be used against me. But then you see the freedom that Erica had, the freedom that was not cheap, right? This freedom was very expensive. Erica earned this freedom to say whatever the hell she wanted to say through pain and struggle and the death of her father. And so it was refreshing to see this freedom, but when you paused and, and, and considered what she went through to get that freedom, you realize that um, it was not only the freedom to say what she wanted to, it was, it was emblematic of the price that so many people pay. So many, unfortunately, so many people have had to pay in the United States of America when dealing with police violence particularly towards black people. Uh, and then you also consider the intersection of her being a black woman uh, and, and how disproportionately this, uh, the families who are left, they're black women who are left to deal with the aftermath of police officers. Um, and she had a freedom that I did not have. And she used that freedom to speak truth to power no matter who Barack Obama, didn't matter. Uh, you know, Bill de Blasio, he got the business. Uh, Eric Holder, he got the business. It did, Hillary Clinton, she got the business. It didn't matter. Donald Trump, whoever, you know, she had this liberty and the freedom to speak truth to power no matter who. And it was something that I admired, um, but it's also something that many people feared. And because of that, a lot of people shut her out. 
And I, I think that's something that we, we have to remember also that a lot of these organizations that are giving voice in, in memoriam for, uh, for, for Erica, they, they did not give her airtime. Matter of fact, the, one of the reasons she had to come on my show to uh, give one of her last, if not her last interview, um, was because these media organizations shut her out. I mean, let's just be real about it, right? So uh, the, the reason she was on my internet show versus on CNN or MSNBC or News One was because a lot of these organizations took offense to how she directly challenged direct Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, the establishment, and you know, that's what it was. And so this is this is uh, you know a sobering reality that you know this is all the, these are all the lenses that we have to consider. Let me take this off my head. It's, it's early in the morning. It's a little colder in in uh, Atlanta than I'm used to, um, than I'm used to in the South. Great weather for Boston. Um, but these are all the different lenses that we have to remember about. Um, Erica Gardner, all the different ways that we should remember, not only uh, her as an individual, as a mother, but her as a, as a freedom fighter, uh, but also remember her uh, as a person who was blacklisted. I mean, literally blacklisted by some of the same people we consider to be allies. And then after she passed away, uh, she was also remembered by several other communities uh, that did not have favorable memories of her. The LGBTQ community, they pulled up tweets of Erica um, making statements that were uh, considered to be homophobic. Um, then there was the, the immigrant community. Several people approached me in my mentions because of the, the tweet that went sim viral or whatever, um, saying that, you know, that she didn't have any respect for the immigrant community. And then, of course, you have the, um, the Hillary Clinton, Obama family who, you know, uh, not literal family, but that cabal of people on the Internet who, if you ever say anything wrong about them, then, you know, sh it doesn't matter who you are. If you ever say anything bad about Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, then you are, um, you're, you're on the outs. They, they remembered her in a very negative way. And, you know, my honest take, if I were to be true and honor Erica and be as free with my words as she was, I would tell all of everyone, everyone who has something negative to say, go to hell. You know, she hasn't even been buried yet. And, you know, if you, you know, if you saw her as an enemy, that's one thing. I mean, sure, go ahead, say what you have to say. But if you considered yourself to be even remotely close to being an ally with her, then to me, it, here's what I was thinking. A lot of people, I got, I got, you know, a lot of people call me out because I, I basically said this, uh, for all the people, all the different groups uh, that are attacking or, you know, pointing out all the negative things about Erica Gardner, all of you will be moved, you, you would have moved on next week and for the next, for the rest of our lives, we're gonna do our part to make sure that people remember Erica in a positive light. Right. So that was the essence of the tweet. Uh, and a lot of people jumped into my mentions uh, uh, about it, um, criticizing me or critiquing me for not giving them an opportunity to say what they want to say. And here's the thing with criticisms and critiques. Everybody has a right to do whatever the hell they want to do. Right. This is clear. You could say whatever you want to say about uh, Erica Gardner. Nobody's going to stop you. But so, too, you can't stop our our, our voices. Our voices that would say, no, no, she wasn't perfect. Yes, she was. She had some uh, some pr problematic, I guess, would be an understatement tweets. But, you know, this was a 27 year old woman. If she was white, they'd consider her a girl. But I, just, I digress, you know, a young woman. And she was propelled into a movement. Not she was she was thrown into it by force. She didn't get into this voluntarily like I did. She didn't get into this navigating the nuances of intersectionality and analyzing what's right and what's, what you should say and what you shouldn't say. She was thrown into it and not really given opportunity. 
She took it. Now, hang on. Let me stop mid-sentence. I want to, I want to stop mid-sentence. Uh, one of the criticisms comes from the LGBTQ community. And then subsequently, you can find tweets on her timeline where she says that she has to grow in this area, that she's learning about her language, particularly it was her language. She was referring to, she was attacking someone with ye old language from the streets. Like, I mean, can we, can we just be realistic about it? She was, she had the language of the streets and so do I. I just knew coming in because I voluntarily got into this that I have to shed all of that before I get out here, right? So I had the luxury of coming into this fully aware of what I could and couldn't say. And so she brought in the language of the street and used some words that were homophobic that uh, was a standard, you know, a, a standard attack that you would get from somebody on the streets, particularly in the black community. And, and this is not to justify or say it was right, but this is to underscore the fact that she was not perfectly intersectional. One, because she was thrown into a national spotlight at an early age, almost against her. She didn't ask to be on this stage. So if I were to thread all this together and, and to move on past it, it would be this, that she died before she got an opportunity to complete her journey towards intersectionality. She died literally doing this work, right? Literally out there. And was one of the last things that she said uh, to me was that sh this was wearing down on her, that, that this, the stress was getting to her and that the system beats you down. She literally died doing this fight and People see this time as the perfect opportunity for better or for worse, good or for bad. However you see it, some people legitimately view this as the right time for them to point out her problems. I disagree. I think that it's the right time for us to mourn her and to bury her and then, then whatever. But if you choose to criticize her because she didn't, she wasn't loving to the immigrant community or she wasn't loving to the, oh, I don't care about the Obama coalition, those folks, you know, if you don't like her because she criticized Obama, I've got nothing to say to you. Um, but if you, you know, have legitimate grievances from the uh, LGBTQ community, um, speak your piece. Nobody's going to stop you from speaking your piece. But also, I would say that we're going to remember more of the good things about her than the bad things about her because she literally out, she literally died during this work. Um, I do have phone lines up eight five seven six hundred zero five one eight. I want to get your. Uh, your input as always. You can weigh in on the discussion. Uh, there's so much more to discuss with Erica, uh, but I think I want to leave it there mainly because, I, I don't know, it's not a lot of, it's been a really rough week. Anybody who was remotely connected to her, anyone who ever did work with her, um, you'd understand this has been a, a, a really, a really rough week in that regard.